So my name is Sigal Yaniv Feller. I'm Deputy Director of JFN Israel and also the Senior Director of Advisory Services at JFN and co-leading the Green Funders Forum together with Marla Stein, who in just a minute I'll hand it over to her and she'll be able to introduce herself and the Green Funders Forum. We're very, very happy to hold this session today. A year ago, we were on suitcases already prepared to fly to Palm Beach, Florida for the annual JFN conference to hold this session in person with all of you and hopefully many others when COVID broke and we had to unpack the suitcases and move on to digital and create uh, Zoom content for a year now. But climate change hasn't disappeared during this year. Quite the contrary, it just became more of an issue, more of a, a pressing issue that we need to deal with. And when uh, we decided to program the plan for this virtual conference, it was very clear to us that we wanted to devote a session on climate change and really discuss this with the Jewish philanthropic community. So the goal of the session today is really to open our ears and hearts and minds to update ourselves about what's going on with climate change and explore some options of what the Jewish philanthropic community can do about it and also learn from some of the active players in the philanthropic community and what they're already doing. So we don't have a lot of time. I'll pass it over to Marla quickly and just say thank you very much to our speakers who have joined us and prepared themselves for this session and Marla for being such a powerhouse and she, you know, constantly pushing and, and, and investing in the environment in Israel and putting that issue on the agenda and making sure no one forgets that it's an important issue. We need people like you to constantly make a difference. So thank you for your leadership and partnership in this. I couldn't have done this without you. Passing it on to you. Thanks, Sigal. Thank you. I am Marla, I'm Marla Stein, and I am the co-chair of the Green Funders Forum. And the Green Funders Forum really strives to be your address for funding in the environment in Israel. And that's whether or not the environment is your main funding priority or whether you'd like to find out about how you can intersect the environment. And with your other key funding priorities or whether you'd like to set aside part of your grant making as a kind of insurance policy. Because I think it's fair to say that we all really care about the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the food that we eat, not to mention transportation and smart cities and just everything around us is the basis for our lives and that is the environment. So we at the Green Funders Forum really is your resource, not only for education and awareness and inspiration, but also to really help you build skills and to help you devise your personal strategies wherever you are on the giving spectrum regarding the environment. So please use this as a resource. So why are we all here today? Why did you come to this session? I think like me, you're probably here to learn more about climate change, which really is one of the greatest threats of humanity today. I think that we're all here also to be inspired by uh, excellent speakers who are really taking real and direct action on the ground. And I think also, and I hope that you're here also to learn about what you can do personally in your grouping strategy to make an impact. And in order to showcase what you can do, we're highlighting three speakers today, starting with Professor Alon Tal of Tel Aviv University. And I'll get back to his longer bio in a second, but Alon will be framing the issues, telling us about climate change, why it is an issue that we all should be very concerned about now whether uh, we're interested in Israel or the general uh, climate scene. And then following Alon's presentation, we're going to, going to have a few minutes for questions for Alon. Stephen Brock presenting his own family foundation, even though his father is also um, joining us as well. Um, and Stephen is also the co-chair of Canada it is leading environmental NGO, the David Suzuki Foundation, and he himself has been active in the environment for several decades of the Nathan Cummings Foundation. And the Nathan Cummings Foundation decades. And so we'll be excited to hear about their new strategies. This is the immediate past chair of
Marla, there's a problem with your Zoom. Freezing up. Marla? Public policy at Tel Aviv University. And he is certainly one of Israel's leading environmental. Um, Marla, your Zoom, your Zoom keeps freezing. Um, Sorry about that, guys. Hey, and here I am. Can you hear me now? Uh, okay. okay, here I am. Can you hear me now? Um, um, voices in Israel, and he has single handed co founded or founded many of our leading environmental organizations, starting with Adam Tabavidin, which is the leading advocacy organization, the Arabai, which promotes collaboration between Israel and her neighbors. He also co founded, and most recently, has the highest birth rate in the OECD. And there are a lot of policy issues that go along with that. Um, Alone has authored or co-edited 11 books on Israel's environment and more than 100 articles. He has uh, an upcoming book coming out called uh, Israel Climate and Security, which he um, co-edited. And he was also the recipient of the prestigious Charles Bronfman Prize. And he is the chair of his own philanthropic foundation, the Tal Fund. So as Alon is speaking, please note your questions in the chat. Welcome, Alon. Thank you so much, Sigal. Thank you so much, Marla. <clears throat> I hope I'm not having acoustic problems. Everybody can hear me clearly? We can hear you. And okay. Alon, let me know if you need me to share the presentation I have. I, I think I'm good with that. Um, <laughs> So first of all, it's so great to see you, Charles and Stephen and Jeff. And it's lucky that I can only see one screen because otherwise I would have to spend the whole talk saying it's wonderful to see uh, so many friends together. Um, for the last six months, I've been working as an advisor to Israel's state controller, which monitors Israeli government activities for their special report on the climate crisis. And we just finished a 300 page report. So to distill it down to a 12 minute presentation is gonna be a challenge. So I'm gonna give you what I think are seven takeaway messages that I think we all need to think about when we think about the climate crisis. And I promised my uh, friends who helped organize this and entrusted me with the opening session that I'd do it, uh, stay in time. So here are seven things you should know about the climate crisis. You know, the great civil rights leader, Martin Luther King once said, there are situations where tomorrow is not today. There is such a thing as being too late. And never was there an environmental problem where irreversibility was more of a, a factor than the climate uh, crisis we face. When the International Panel on Climate Change came out with its 1.5 report in 2019, that wasn't 1.5 like addition, that's 1.5 degrees. What they basically said was, look, we have a decade, a decade to control our greenhouse gases and hopefully retain a global temperature doesn't exceed 1.5 degrees, because if we get to two degrees, we're going to lead, find ourselves in a climate chaos, which we might find a, a irreversible and a lead us to places we have no idea where it would take us. So first of all, I'm going to dispose of the mandatory uh, photograph of a polar bear, which every climate change one has to do, but it's not a joke, because if we get to two degrees, there will simply no be, be no ice in the summer times in the North Pole. That's the meaning. That means the end of polar bears, that they can't make it without. And there are many, many other uh, disturbances and um, environmental damages which are uh, serious. And indeed, this is not going to be an easy task to try to keep within the constraints that the international community has set for us. Um, the magnitude is daunting, but we have no choice. It's, it's our children's future. Um, I'm now completing a book that came out last month. It's highly recommended. Bill Gates called it How to Avoid a Climate Disaster. And he starts the book by talking about 51 billion to zero. And of course, he's talking about the tons of greenhouse gases, which we release as humanity every year. And we've got to bring it to zero as soon as we possibly can. The sooner we do it, the better the chance we'll leave our kids some kind of climatic stability, okay? So this is what we're looking at here in terms of the emissions. And there's many different scenarios we can be in. We need to drive it down to zero. This has now become a, um, an accepted government policy. Even President Biden has gone forward and called for uh, really a, a carbon neutral economy by 2050 in the United States. 
And that set a standard, which now we are hearing Bibi Netanyahu pay lip service to, but it's not just something we need to pay lip service to, we need to change a lot of things. This is the sort of global breakdown of, of uh, emissions. And so when we talk about the uh, challenge of renewable energy, it's extremely important, but worldwide, that's only about 30%. If we talk about electricity of the overall emissions and Israel's maybe 40%, but there's a lot of other areas where we're gonna have to do much, much better and, and realize that this is something which is not just a magic bullet with uh, solar or wind energy. That's incredibly important, maybe the single biggest part, but it's not enough to do it by itself. The third point I wanna make is that Israel is a climate change hotspot like the entire Middle East. We are seeing temperature rises that uh, people like Al Gore thought we'd only see in 30 or 40 years. Um, last year in Israel, we saw a spike near the uh, Dead Sea, which was over uh, 49.8, basically reaching 50 degrees for the first time in Israeli history. Um, of course, it's not just the high temperatures, it's the extreme weather events. In 2019, the whole country was brokenhearted when a young couple in Southern Tel Aviv were trapped in an elevator and were flooded until they eventually drowned uh, because of an extreme storm event, which was supposed to be a hundred year storm event, only it happened again this year as well. It's no surprise that Southern Tel Aviv, the uh, poor part of Tel Aviv has the worst drainage and the people there suffer the greatest amount. Nahari has now become a climate, uh, a center of climate refugees where people have to leave every winter as the floods hit them. So we now know that we're seeing new weather patterns in Israel that were never seen before. I uh, uh, am deputy chairman of the, the KKL JNF, not an easy job. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of deep uh, accounting to five I have to do to take myself calm. It's not an easy organization, but we do run the forests in Israel. This is my favorite forest, Beit Keshet Forest. It's lovely and luscious. Only this past uh, Sukkot, we lost 15,000 dunams of land. That's more than we lost in the Great Carmel Fire. The frequency of forest fires, just like it is in California, just like it is in Australia, are going up in Israel. That's what it means when your temperature changes. Our water supply is changing. In the north of Israel, we know we have a 20% lower drop in rainfall. So all these things point to the fact that we are a climate change hotspot. And Israel will feel it first. So you'd expect Israel to be getting under the, the, the proverbial uh, stretcher and doing something to help our ailing earth, but we're not doing enough. If you take a look at our um, emissions over time, you can see here, this is from the report we submitted to the UN, the Climate Change Convention, you can see the energy sector going up, fuel combustion going up in every sector, despite our lip service, we've done worse. Now in 2015, Prime Minister Netanyahu came to Paris and he made certain promises and it's really important that we started to engage and that we start having top level commitment. But our commitment was to have 7.7 uh, .7 tons of CO2 per person per capita. The trouble is that our population is growing uh, very quickly. So of all the promises we made it in Paris, um, really the only one we've actually done is meet, trying to meet the uh, renewable energy goals by 2030. But those made put us in a very low place because when you consider the population, we'll be looking at a 45% increase in our emissions if we meet the Paris Accord. So we now have to look at the potential, just to give you a sense, look where the world is in terms of their commitment to reduce emissions. But because Israel sort of put in the per capita, think we're gonna reduce it, but we're having so many people growing, we have uh, a massive uh, increase over the next coming years. Now we have uh, converted from coal to natural gas here. So that's very important in reducing it, but it's not enough. And if we look where Israel is in terms of its emitment, we're now at 9% renewables compared to the rest of the developed country. It, it's not enough and we need to do much, much better. We have an opportunity to do better in Glasgow. In November, the world comes together and presents its new objectives. And this is an opportunity for all those who care about Israel's climate change performance to make us do a better job. We're up to message number six, and that is real progress, I believe in Israel, and I think also in the United States, only it will happen when civil society has the resources it needs to make its voice heard, to say the inconvenient truths that sometimes decision makers have a hard time with. This is a picture of our national climate march. Unfortunately, last year we couldn't hold it. I believe this year after vaccinations, we will. We're gonna give the credit here to the Green Course, the student organization, which brought, I think the last time was 15,000 people. It was an astonishing inspirational event. Really, you can see Israelis from all uh, people coming together. But we have to recognize that we're thinking globally that there are many, many challenges and it's only the uh, civil society, for example, that points out that you can't separate the issue of population growth and overshoot with 
emissions. They are very much linked. And uh, the best way, if you want to reduce your emissions, this was an article that came out three years ago. You can see you can do a lot of things. You can recycle and get rid of your dryer, you drive an electric car, use renewable energy, but having one less child is, is particularly uh, invaluable in that. And there's an organization now in Israel which talks about these kind of things, how that if we don't link these issues together. Another inconvenient issue that we don't talk about enough as government decision makers is the, as our diets, okay? We know that uh, cows produce about 17, some people say 24% of the globe, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We can't continue to consume meat that we have and we have a Meatless Money was an international organization, it was brought to Israel recently. And for those of you who are looking for, I think, a ter I think probably the most interesting book I've read about climate change in the last years, a shout out for Jonathan Safran Foer's book, We Are the Weather, which now is available in Hebrew as well. Um, a, a very, very important testimonial about why we need to change our diets, why being Jewish means rethinking certain uh, conventional dietary matters. I just wanna point out that there are many, many wonderful organizations out there that are doing great things, that are engaged in the climate change. Each one has its own niche because it's a very complicated issue. I could talk about uh, them at length. I don't think we have time here, Sigal, perhaps in the Q&A, but these are just uh, a handful of some of the national organizations which you may know, but all of them are worth contacting if you're concerned about this issue. And if you're thinking about the state side, you, you can't talk about the Jewish world and climate change without talking about Chazon, which has always been a pioneer. And I've learned so much from them on any number of topics. And the final and last slide, oh, well, this is not quite there yet. One of the great things about climate change is its potential to engage young people. The uh, so-called strike for the future, the Greta Thunberg Youth Organization has come to Israel with a vengeance. We have wonderful youth who are staging sit-ins and holding our feet to the fire and creating a whole new dynamic. I'm in a political campaign now running around for the blue and white party, talking about the environment. Everywhere I go, I find youth who are saying, yes, Alon, you're, you're promising. It's not enough. We have to save the planet. And so if we're looking for a way to bring Jewish youth into our uh, some of our concerns, if we can somehow find that nexus between the Jewish world or the Israeli world and the environmental world, I think it's compelling. And the last slide I have, and I think I managed to stay on time, is of course that this is an issue which involves all of us, that every single one of us can find ways to change our lives to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. And uh, I think we, it goes the way we, the kind of products that we consume, the way if we travel, then we can offset our flights. And, and uh, certainly I mentioned already uh, changing our diet. But there are so many things we all can do. And so that wherever you are, whatever your foundation is, for example, just in the way you invest your money, there are climate responsible ways to invest. And that's a challenge perhaps that all of the Jewish funders might want to consider. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity, but I do want to get back to this issue of urgency. As uh, Hillel said in, in the Pirkei Avot, if not, now, when? We have a decade to turn this thing around and give our kids a planet that we receive with some sort of climatic stability. Let's do our part. We have a few questions. Um, I know that there was a question actually submitted beforehand. If you can talk about um, how Israel, how the environment in Israel impacts low income communities in Israel, or those who live in fragile or extreme environments like the Bedouin. Well, climate justice is a, um, a whole field. And, and I think it's very real. Certainly on the global level, we recognize that the countries who are already being most affected by um, climate change are those who contributed the least to the, the changing of temperature and the uh, concentration of greenhouse gases. I'm talking about the, the small island nations. I'm talking about the countries in the Sahel, which are seeing very, very rapid ones. And I think that certainly Israel's vulnerable communities are facing it. In the Arab world, we know, for example, already in countries like Iraq or Egypt, Having a air conditioner is the difference between life and death. When the temperatures start to spiral up over 50 degrees centigrade, I don't know what that is, 125, 130, we really, uh, there's no way to get by without that. So yes, our uh, unrecognized Bedouin villages have, are much more vulnerable. And I hope that as part of Israel's general efforts to up upgrade the quality of their life and bring us a little bit of greater um, egalitarian ethos to, the, to that part of our country, climate justice will be part of the package. Thank you. And one more question for Alon is, what is being done for cross-border uh, problems and what are the solutions? Well, there are really uh, two magnificent 
environmental organizations, and I've been involved in both of them for many years. One of them is the Eco Peace Middle East. I was in a board meeting yesterday, which has a green, uh, new, a blue New Deal issue where they have a, a water energy nexus. They're can, they're lobbying for where Israel will provide the desalinated water to relieve Jordan of its tremendous water shortages. Remember in Amman, Jordan, people receive water eight hours a week. That's what they get for a variety of reasons. There's just a scarcity there, which when they took in 2 million uh, Syrian refugees got a lot worse. But that of course comes from desalination, which has a heavy carbon footprint. So the idea is let's use the massive amounts of land. Jordan of course has four times the land of Israel and use that land for a solar energy supply to Israel. And indeed, if you read the peace agreements that came out in 19, our 1994 agreement with, with Jordan, there's a whole section there. And I'm glad that Yossi Abramovich is with us because he's been thinking about this for, for two decades and he might wanna expand on that if, if there's a chance later on, but this is certainly an area. Um, the Arava Institute for Environmental Studies, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this wonderful institution where Israelis, Palestinians, Jordanians, international students come together and think about this. There's a solar uh, research center. In fact, the head of the solar center, who was a Palestinian Arab, was just uh, Tarek uh, Abu Hamor, was just appointed to be the, the director, which I think in itself is an important moment in the environmental community when a major seemingly Jewish institution appoints a Palestinian scientist to be their director. But I think there's a lot that could be done. Uh, the This uh, regional the region is going to be hit hard by climate change, and if we work together, we'll do a better job of solving it. Thank you, Alon. I see that there are some other questions in the chat, but just in the interest of time, we're going to move on to Stephen Bronfman, who is our next speaker. Stephen is the fourth generation of the Bronfman family devoted to community and philanthropy. Stephen is the executive chairman of Claridge, which is a private investment firm, and he's also the co-chair of his own family foundation, the Claudine and Stephen Family Foundation, and he is the co-chair of the David Suzuki Foundation. And as I mentioned, I don't know if you heard me, but um, the David Suzuki Foundation is the leading environmental NGO in Canada. They work with uh, government and business to resolve critical environmental issues. And they also empower people to take action in their communities to be part of the solution. Stephen, we're going to hear about Stephen's journey as a leader in philanthropic action in climate change in Canada, including how he promotes collaboration in the field. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Marla. Thanks, Sigal. Hi, Dad, Rita. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's been a long journey. Uh, as, a young, as a young lad, I used to watch, every Sunday I used to watch uh, Marlon Perkins' Mutual of Omaha as Wild Kingdom. And uh, every Sunday, every Sunday, it was little. And uh, I guess I had an impression. I was lucky enough to go to summer camp in the Green Mountains of Vermont. We had a, a home in the Laurentians and I played a lot of sport. And I guess just to get myself out of school because I wasn't all that academic. I played on a lot of sports teams growing up and I guess maybe to get out of certain things, but maybe deep down just to a drive to keep me uh, in the outdoors. So I, I didn't necessarily grow up a, as a, someone who was a, much of a tree hugger, but uh, I grew up as someone who liked to play and liked to be outside. Um, also, scholastically was a, a challenge. And, and as a kid, um, I had a lot of uh, difficulty finding direction. I mean, I was a privileged kid with uh, so many choices and, and I, I really didn't find much of a direction in my dad who is one of my great teachers in life. Uh, he knew me, I think at, at the time at 19, better than I knew myself. And dad had been down, he had spent some time, he was in Israel and spent some time with a young ranger named Yuval Peled uh, down in the Elat region. And he connected with Yuval and he said, oh, you know what, I think Stephen would, would enjoy spending time with him. So it was one of my first trips to Israel, but I went and I spent two weeks with Yuval living in, he lived in this wonderful little house, Beit Williams down in, in, uh, in Elat. And I would go out with Yuval on his, uh, his tours every day. We'd get up at 4.30 in the morning. We'd go in the Jeeps and we'd sort of be rangers and we'd be out and, in, out and about. And what I realized after those two weeks that I spent with him was that every little bit of information that was coming from Yuval and me and just the time that we were spending outside, it was really sticking. Like, you know, you, you can, it was just information that was coming in 
that made sense to me. And I don't know why, but today I could tell you about the symbiotic relationship between uh, ants and the acacia tree. And, and don't, you don't, I won't bore you to tears, but I could talk to uh, you a lot about that. And, that, and I was trying to understand, well, why is it that this information sticks with, these, with me so much? So that stayed within me. And then uh, I, I got lucky enough to meet uh, this fellow named David Suzuki, who um, he had the gift of communication. So David Suzuki is a, is a biologist. He's a Canadian uh, who became a, a national icon. He's a broadcaster, ran a show called The Nature of Things. And I started doing some, some work for David and I got quite inspired. And um, I guess uh, I've been on that board for over 25 years. Um, and. Uh, he's been another great mentor in my life, uh, aside from my dad, uh, a great teacher, uh, someone who can take science and can just disseminate that information to the average uh, person. And he's, he's really a very, very well respected and I, like I said, iconic Canadian. So I learned a lot, a lot, a lot from him. And early on, when David was discussing issues about climate, I mean, we're talking over 20 years ago, um, I think the issue was just too big for uh, people to grapple with. And they said, well, how, what is this huge thing? Anyways, I ended up uh, being sort of a funder of the Suzuki Foundation uh, Climate Initiative, where no one was really doing anything. And I guess that started the snowball effect and started to garner more uh, funding and garner more trust and, and people started to listen because all this environmental work, it really is just about education and it's all very, very long term. So at the end of the day, what are you trying to influence? You're trying to influence policy change. You're trying to influence people's view on issues, right? And at the end of the day, it's, it can be difficult because you're always dealing with governments. Governments come in, they come out. We don't take a penny uh, from government at Suzuki Foundation because then we couldn't you know, speak up against them with with any credibility. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, it just, it's this long-term plan. And, and so when I'm going out and I do all the fundraising for Suzuki Foundation, um, I think I have some respect out there because it's not a flash in the pan. I've been with it. I've been sort of convicted to the issues for, you know, I've been on the board for 25 years, but I think I've been working with David for 35 years. Um, and it, it's been, it's been life-changing. And really what's happened through that is um, Marla talked about the air we breathe and the water we drink and you know a fire and earth and and you know it's really trickles down into everything that you are so a lot of business choices the homes that we live in um, you know the environment is sort of it, it's all about choice it's all about sustainability it's all about how you view things and 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 the the, the step that you take in life and you know, I've just sort of learned along the way. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, also, you're trying to be influential and you're trying to influence others when it comes to funding. You're trying to influence others to, to follow the path and, and to join uh, the fight. I mean, really, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a grassroots uh, movement. You're trying to inspire people. And I think by being convicted on certain issues. Another thing I learned about my dad is when I was sort of uh, looking for direction and uh, I wasn't sure what I was going to do with my, in my life. My dad gave me great advice and he said, well, son, he said, whatever you choose, just make sure that you're passionate about it and that you do a great job. And so, you know, I've been fortunate in life to, to be involved either in business or in philanthropy and things that I understand, things that I'm passionate about and things that I, I, that, that I can really make a difference in. And I think uh, by, by keeping this focus and working with other foundations and trying to you know, because we all have small pieces that we're trying to do things and um, we can make a lot more noise working together and pooling our resources and pooling our mindsets and pooling our ideas and trying to attack uh, certain issues like climate. So, you know, it's a huge worldwide issue. I had a terrible meeting with a very uh, wealthy uh, Montrealer who at the end of my pitch, he looked at me and said, well, why even bother? Because look at what China and India are doing. Why, you're not even gonna scratch the surface. So you, you can have the black uh, sort of naysayer glass half empty uh, point of view, or you can say, you know what, to hell with that. We're gonna do the best we can and we're gonna tackle the issues piece by piece by piece by piece. And that's what we're doing. So, um, you know, that's been something that's really driven me and my decisions in life. Uh, even on the investment side, you know, about, uh, you know, responsible investing. And, uh, you know, it's great that ESG has become such a big part of sort of the larger fund and banking world and, and whatnot and the impact investing. And 
it's great to see how all the huge multinational car companies, you know, have made big statements about uh, going electric and, you know, this trickle effect uh, is, is having a hell of effect. And one last word is that, um, you know, the work with David Suzuki 50 years ago, when he started the nature of things, he was viewed as a radical hippie communist, right? And he hasn't changed his message one iota. And the words that he says today, which are the same words he said 50 years ago, are sort of commonplace. And so that's where victories have come. They're long term, but you're just trying to change the rhetoric and change people's view about what really matters. And I think, um, you know, through this pandemic, we've been able to focus on things that really matter our health, nature around us, time with loved ones. They're all basics. And really that what, that's what it boils down to is respecting the basics and respecting your health and the beauty that surrounds you. So that's what motivates me. And thanks very much. Excellent, Stephen. And I'm so happy to hear that you got some of your inspiration starting out from Israel's environment and look how much you took it to Canada to make the difference that you have and really changing the discourse and really making climate change part of the everyday yeah, Israel, Israel, Israel had a huge, uh, has a huge start for me. And, and at the same time, we got involved through our Karev Foundation and through ourselves, uh, getting involved with uh, being partners in the bike path from north to south, getting involved with uh, the, the, the drive to help stop uh, the overpaving and to leave nature corridors because, you know, Israel's in the middle of the Great Rift Valley and, and from, from the birds to the animals and the fallow deers and, and whatnot crossing the country. So, yeah, Israel's played a huge role as well. Excellent. Um, I wanted to just ask you a bit, little bit more about your collaborative efforts. I remember, I believe that you said that you actually convene other funders to try to raise awareness. Can you tell us a minute about that? Yeah, well, we did something similar to what you're doing right now, which is so great. And I applaud you for, for bringing funders together um, on this issue. Uh, we took uh, right before the pandemic, probably a few months before, we convened uh, the larger foundations in our area and we had an information session. We spent a day uh, bringing up issues about people that were interested in the environment, but not necessarily invested in the environment, and uh, people that had means that were looking for um, ideas. And so it's just sort of really, again, trying to inspire um, uh, Claridge Epstein and me, Claridge who run, uh, Clarence, who runs our, our foundation, our executive director and I, we're, we're really trying our best to to assemble and we've done that. We've assembled a, a group of, of five uh, solid um, foundations in Montreal that are pooling resources and looking for actual projects to, to collaborate on. So it's very, very good because a lot of times, you know, when um, foundations are really on their single path and by their, their, their donor and, and really want to do their own thing and make their own mark, but you know, you can do more if you're, if you're a team. That is actually an inspiration for us at the Green Funders Forum. I really think that collaboration is the way to go, especially because there are a lot of smaller family foundations who want to increase their impact through collaboration. And I, I think it's probably fair to say that, um, Stephen, you and Clarence probably see yourself as resources for other foundations that want to jump in and that they can turn to you. Well, we have an expertise, I think, through time, right? So yeah, we try and play that role. Very good. So I'm sure there were probably more questions for Stephen. So if you'll just continue to jot them down in the chat and we'll now turn to Valerie Bucard, who is representing the Nathan Cummings Foundation. The Nathan Cummings Foundation is a perfect example of a foundation that works at the intersection of the environment um, with other social issues. And in this case with social and economic justice as well as racial, racial equality. Valerie has more than 20 years of experience developing and managing programs in environmental justice, poverty, and global education. Prior to her work with the Nathan Cummings Foundation, Valerie worked with USAID in Haiti, Hunger Free America, and Artists for Peace and Justice. She also worked in the private sector, developing corporate socially and environmentally responsible investment opportunities to advance environmental sustainability. At the Nathan Cummings Foundation, Valerie works on issues related to environmental and climate justice and economic inclusion in her role as the program director of the Inclusive Clean Economy Issue Area. Welcome, Valerie. 
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's really great to be here. And I thank you to all the JFN team and my, my colleagues um, for, for bringing us together today. Um, I'm actually a senior program associate at the Nathan Cummings Foundation. Um, you know, thank you, Marla, for that great introduction. Uh, we're a multi-generational family foundation rooted in the Jewish tradition of social justice that works to create a just, vibrant, sustainable, and democratic society in the U.S. and Israel. Um, and I'm currently leading our Inclusive Queen Econ Economy grant making. Um, I think it's important to note we've recently adopted um, a set of values and a vision. Uh, you can find more about that on our website, but I think it's important to mention, you know, just a few of the values we've lifted up, justice and equity, interdependence, uh, and courageous transformation. And these are important to note because, you know, first of all, they've shown up in our work for many years, and they don't just inform our grant making, but how we do the work, how we partner and collaborate with our grantees, with each other, and with our peers in the field. Um, I want to take just a couple minutes to share a little bit about NCF's history in this space and how that has informed our current grant making. Well, we've supported work in the environment and energy sector for over 30 years. And um, our past environment funding has covered a range of issues, including not limited to um, transportation, sustainable societies, environmental vision and values, and ecological health, which I had the pleasure of uh, working in 20 years ago. Um, it's actually my second tenure at Nathan Cummings. Um, and we formalized uh, first, our first strategy to promote environmental justice about 20 years ago and really looking at how we could focus on efforts to protect vulnerable communities from environmental degradation. So in 2015, building on this history of work um, and following a multi-year strategic planning process where we aligned um, our grant making on in climate change and inequality, you know, so we have uh, at that point launched a new inclusive clean economy program in recognition of the deep interconnection between these two issues. And the goal of this focus area is to support a just transition to an inclusive and clean economy that works for all. And I know just transition gets tossed around a lot. It can mean many different things to many people. And in this case, what we're talking about is a framework developed by one of our grantees, the Climate Justice Alliance and Movement Generation that looks at how we move from an extractive to a regenerative economy. So we understand that there is already a transition underway. We see it in the incredible growth of the renewable energy sector, um, in electric vehicle infrastructure. We see it in the 30 US states that have adopted renewable portfolio standards, really looking at how they can set goals to reduce or eliminate greenhouse gas emissions and incre increase renewable energy. Um, nine of those states have set 100% renewable energy targets. And we also see this transition in the individual companies and organizations working to reduce their carbon footprint and in movements that mobilize young people, impacted communities and scientists demanding climate action. And you know, as, as Marla mentioned, we also see climate change as an issue of social, racial and economic justice. Poverty and systemic racism in the United States have been key drivers of who gets to pollute where and when and also who benefits from the fossil fuel economy. So we see a tremendous opportunity for economic growth in the renewable energy and clean economy where we, when we can embed equity rooted provisions. And what I mean by that are prevailing wages, job quality, worker protections for those that are moving from extractive to um, renewable sectors, and also direct investment in impacted communities, those that are hit first and worst by climate change um, impacts and the fossil fuel industry. Those tend to be communities of color and low income communities that are disproportionately affected. So we see these kinds of provisions are not as a nice to have, but as part of a winning strategy that builds the political will to advance an inclusive and clean, and clean economy that works for all people. And we know that climate change demands collective action on an unprecedented scale, and that can feel overwhelming. Um, but much of the broader narrative on climate has tended to focus on sea level rise and future impacts. But we also see communities on the front lines are facing significant impacts now. And they're also advancing some really powerful and compelling community-driven solutions that address climate change and racial and economic inequality simultaneously. 
I think it's important to note here that centering those most impacted is really core to how we approach the work and everything we do. So to address some of these challenges, we have been supporting over the past six years, three essential strategies of work. Um, at the center of our inclusive clean economy grant making is support for movement building. These are efforts that center those hit first and worst, low income communities and communities of color and indigenous communities as the architects of climate and energy policy solutions. Our grantees demonstrate that communities most harmed are also advancing some really powerful solutions to the climate crisis that prioritize racial equity and leverage the economic opportunities the transition creates to strengthen local economies. One example of this is a group called New York Renews. It is a multiracial cost sector coalition of about 200 partners and counting, working and working to um, advance some of the strongest equity first climate policy in the United States. Their approach was designed to build the political will needed in New York State that resulted in a mandate to achieve 100% renewable energy economy wide by 2050. New York State's policy includes several environmental justice components with the coalition worked very hard to embed, um, including a requirement to direct at least 40% of the program's benefits to historically disadvantaged communities. Part of the reason for this is we really believe deeply that strengthening movements that bring directly affected voices to decision making tables is a critical strategy to build power in ways that shift the policy landscape on climate and address the underlying systemic racial and economic inequality communities face. The second strategy we support is looks at you know demonstrating what a just transition looks on the looks like on the ground. These are projects that create tangible impact in place that offer replicable models that can be scaled that center equity and inclusion from go. I think a great example of this work is a support to a group called EPROS. It's a they've developed a community-led green resiliency industrial district or grid vision and framework to advance a just transition that includes the first community owned solar energy cooperative in New York City, which launched uh, at the end of last year a climate resiliency assistance and plans for local businesses on the waterfront and sustainable economic development, including local jobs and a partnership with an offshore wind company, Equinor in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. They're now working with the city to transition high, high polluting local utility plants to renewable energy and also to explore potential to scale this grid framework to other neighborhoods in the city and state. And though this work is local and deeply remote rooted in community, UPROS is also informing organizing strategy at state and federal tables in collaboration with frontline environmental and climate justice groups, labor, unions, and organizations and other partners in New York and nationally. Finally, our third strategy is our work to shift narratives. And what we think about there is how do we center people? Um, who gets to tell the story? I mean, in so much of the media, you see, you know, those great pictures of polar bears um, and, and the environment. But what we often don't see are people who are impacted by this on a daily basis today and now. Um, so our work is really looking at how we can lift up not only the impacts they're facing now on the ground, but also the solutions they're bringing forward and support their efforts to tell their own stories. And one of the ways that we do that is through support for an organization called the Solutions Project. It's an intermediary group that is driving significant resources to the ground for grassroots environmental and climate justice groups to really lift up those stories in part of a broader narrative. Um, so that's, um, that's our, our three main strategies. And I think it's also important to note that there's a lot of cross programmatic work that happens within the foundation. So inclusive clean economy is not the only area that has climate related grant making. Um, I also partner with our corporate political accountability program, looking at how we can activate and organize investors to push companies for action on climate change. So that's a great example of some cross programmatic um, work that we've done there. Um, so I don't want to dwell too much on these in the essence of time, but I also want to share a couple of ways beyond the grant making dollar that we support our climate work. Um, I mentioned our corporate political accountability program, um, our, our director, Laura Campos, 
Also, um, in addition to that program, runs and leads our shareholder engagement. We use our voice and standing as an investor to shift markets and change corporate behavior to further progress on climate change and inequality while protecting long-term shareholder value. And we've submitted over 200 shareholder proposals to companies over the last 16 years. Um, We've also made a decision, the board made a decision about three years ago to align our endowment with our mission. And that includes looking at our investments across the board and how we are furthering our mission to address climate change and inequality. Um, impact investing is fairly new for us, but it's definitely an area of exploration. And there are certainly linkages between some of the work that our grantees are building out and also broader utility scale projects in the field. And finally, um, this has been mentioned a lot, but uh, a bit in the, in the space today, but there are peer learning spaces and collaborative funds that helped us to really understand the landscape of organizations working in this space, um, especially where there is a racial and economic justice focus, which is really critical to how we view the work. And it helps also to drive additional support to bottom up movement led strategies to address climate. So given the urgency of the issue, its impact on communities now and the tremendous economic opportunity to advance an inclusive and clean economy that works for all people, we continue to leverage our grant making, our shareholder engagement and our endowment in pursuit of justice for people and the planet. So I will stop there and take any questions. Wow, Valerie, that is, that is uh, quite a portfolio <laughs> of responsibilities. That is amazing. But what I, I really love is that I, I definitely, I personally believe that there, it's not a zero sum game. Uh, so many people come to me and say, no, we have to worry about Iran. We can't worry about the environment. But I think what we see here is that it's all embedded. It's not, they're all, they're all so interrelated that it's not a zero sum game and we have to work at them from all angles all of the time and from all the different, uh, even within the foundation and when the, within the issues as well. So that's, uh, that's a lot of lessons for us. And I think um, who we're asking about Bedouin is probably also a lot of lessons um, from social justice and racial equality that probably you can pursue another conversation with Valerie about that as well afterwards. Um, we just have a few more minutes for questions. So um, actually there was a question in the chat uh, back for Stephen. So actually Alone is asking, has the Suzuki Foundation taken a position on the Keystone Pipeline and the US cancellation of that? Um, and should Jewish organizations express a view on such controversies? Hard to answer the second part, Alon. Uh, on the first part, of course, Suzuki Foundation has been anti-pipeline, you know, um, forever. Just because, you know, anything that sort of spurns on the con continuous fossil fuel development in northern Alberta is something that they stand up against. Um, I kind of stand on both sides, where because uh, I do a lot of work with the Liberal government here in Canada. And um, when there were two pipeline issues coming up, one uh, Trudeau voted for and one he voted against. And I do believe that things have to be phased out, that you can't just go from A to, to Z. You know, you have to, you know, we all know that the fossil fuel economy uh, in the next 20, 30 years is really going to grind down to a halt. But in the meantime, you have economies, you have jobs, and you have parts of your countries, various countries that really, really depend on some development. So um, I do butt heads from time to time with, with David and with the board, uh, because I do believe that uh, things need to be phased out, that they can't just be stopped. Um, and I believe in, you know, doing things sustainably, like forestry, like all of our natural resources, which is basically what the Canadian economy is based on, is a natural resource based economy that just needs to be managed smartly. So uh, the Jewish issue is another one I could, my dad could probably answer, and not me. Um, okay, and now I'm gonna jump back actually for a question uh, for Alone that, well, actually I'll just say that of course the Cummings Foundation has done amazing work in Israel um, and was one of the founders of the Green Environment Fund uh, along with um, the, Char the Karen Karev, uh, Charles Bronfman Foundation. Um, and we'll welcome you back in whatever space you want to come back anytime. Um, jumping back to Alone, there was a question way back actually from asking about um, how can we share or express the urgency of the crisis within the Jewish community? How can we continue building 
awareness, not only in Israel, but abroad? Well, I think that it really depends on the framework of a Jewish community. Many communities are synagogue based and clearly having rabbis on board is extremely important. I would hope that the uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary, Yeshiva University, Hebrew Union College, the major producer of rabbis, certainly in North America and probably for much of the world, would uh, consider a climate component. I know at Tel Aviv University now, we're moving towards what we hope will be a required course for all students. This year, we had our first online course, 600 students took it, and, and we think it's an important step. So that's one place to start, but that maybe is good for the future. Um, I think that the Jewish communities tend to be very bottom up. And that if particularly young people express an interest, I think the Jewish community will be responsive. We're all concerned about Jewish continuity. And if we can find this nexus between environmentalism and Judaism, I, I believe that it'll be a, an easy sell to federations to uh, the problem, of course, is that so many young Jews are not even affiliated in any way. And to show them that there's a real space where they can manifest their environmental values, um, you know, in the same way, the, the testimonial that, that Stephen gave, I think so many people at, at a young age who are looking for something spiritual and to get out of the sort of the sterile reality that they had thought that Judaism, and we have so much to offer, and there are wonderful environmental uh, Jewish organizations. Uh, and I think that's uh, maybe the best way to start getting more people engaged. I don't know if that's helpful, but uh, perhaps somebody who's stronger in the American Jewish community can offer a, a better answer on that. Um, there's another question here. Um, how does the general social consciousness around environmental concerns differ between the U.S. and Israel? Alone, that might be a good question for you. Well, the first thing is that tragically, the environment has become a politicized issue in the United States, so that the polarization between Republicans and Democrats has an environmental component, which never existed originally, say, when Richard Nixon was president or even when George Bush uh, Sr. was president. But today it's unfortunately become part of the social divide. And that is not the case in Israel. So that uh, there's no real need even to reach across the uh, aisle, so to speak, to promote environmental issues. You can find strong environmental candidates <clears throat> on, in all parties. And I say that unfortunately, because I'm running for Knesset for the blue and white party. And there's some very people with good credentials from many other parties. And then I think that's, a, that's actually a good thing. And uh, that would be a, a major difference. I, would like to hope, although I think maybe might be a generalization, that Israelis have a sort of a more romantic um, feel towards their country. Children are given a certain literacy and the taxonomy of the flowers and the birds and nature at a very young age, and they carry that with them into sort of an obsession with hiking. And that is also maybe something which uh, might define Israeli environmentalism. Uh -oh. <laughs> Please stay with us for the last few minutes. You can just mute the launch pool platform. We have a green light to continue for a few more minutes, Marla, so go ahead. Well, okay. I actually wanted to go back to Stephen and ask about um, trying to do more in the green economy and include job inclusion in the environment. Is the David Suzuki Foundation involved with that? Um, you know what, very interesting question. Uh, years ago, I brought uh, Tom Friedman, a uh, New York Times writer, uh, up to Montreal and uh, to speak to a group, uh, we did it as a funding activity, to speak to a group, uh, we had about 350 people uh, congregated and, and, uh, and um, he came up and he, he st Tom started the, his talk saying, you know, that he said, I'm not an environmentalist. He said, but I'm a proud American that is pissed off that we're not doing anything to spur our green economy and we're losing thousands and zillions of jobs and dollars to China and to other markets that are a lot more aggressive in the field. And so I think that what's happening is um, economies are adjusting. Uh, Suzuki Foundation is more uh, on the lobbying side of that, but um, you know that there, there has to be switch. Uh, we have one of our provinces here in Canada is Alberta, which is very heavily uh, tilted to oil and gas and has had just a disastrous uh, few years. And, you know, you don't retool that economy overnight. So, um, you know, I think uh, technology, I think um, science and education all sort of blend together into developing uh, new thrusts for, you know, retooling all these people that are losing jobs in the, in the oil and gas uh, sectors. 
I'd like to jump in with something here I think is really important to raise as well, because we have been very active in this um, in this space through a couple of grantees. I mentioned one uprose, but we've got a few others that are really working with um, city governments, state governments, other stakeholders to build out um, whether that's renewable energy infrastructure, but really looking at how you embed these economic inclusion practices as that transition is happening. And I think it's really important for a couple of reasons. Um, the renewable energy sector in the United States tends to be overwhelmingly low paid, lacking unionization, lacking health and safety benefits. And it's a huge block, um, not just in achieving the kinds of economic inclusion and growth that we wanna see, um, but also in terms of bringing labor on board. Time and time again, we've seen labor unions in some cases block um, progressive renewable energy policies or transition policies because how are you gonna ask someone to give up a $70,000 a year pipeline job to go install solar panels for $10 an hour? That's a race to the bottom that we have to address. Um, and it's important to bring and broaden the coalition and to make the green economy a really attractive one, right? Um, so that builds um, political will, that builds um, local economies, that creates tangible impact that people can see in place. And there are a couple of really great organizations that are helping cities and, and multiple stakeholders address these issues concurrently. One of them is called Emerald Cities. Um, another is Jobs to Move America. Um, so happy to talk more about that offline, but I think it's just important point to add on the US side. I'm gonna jump back to Alon and ask um, for small funders in this space, what do you suggest for small, how small funders can jump in? Well, as a small funder, we have a very small and modest family foundation <clears throat> you really want to be strategic. And the truth of the matter is there are wonderful grassroots organizations which sometimes don't have the capacity to fill out the paperwork and jump through the hoops that a more serious uh, foundation, which has perhaps a more commi greater commitment to due diligence requires. And so taking chances and helping them, uh, just yesterday I was visiting Citizens for Clean Air, a new Israeli environmental NGO that we gave just an $8,000 grant to, and they were over the moon that they could finally get somebody who understood Facebook to get uh, out the word and to create some action for them. So I would say uh, the fact that you're a small foundation and uh, doesn't mean you can't be involved, but also Marla's recommendation that you would find partners and leverage or be leveraged is also a, a good strategy. And I, I want to also add that a program that I'm involved with, oh, and actually that the Green Environment Fund, thanks to Charles Bronfman and the Cummings Foundation started, is the Shelley Fund. Um, I don't know if Charles Bronfman is still on, but uh, this was one of the things, and I think Alone also suggested that there are, there are groups of activists that really are volunteers and just need micro grants and either in order to push them forward. And so this is something that has continued as the Shelley Fund grants that are up to a maximum of $5,000 in a cycle. And it really gives them the boost they need to make a difference. And like one win recently was Modi'in area in central Israel, just last week or the last two weeks, finally, after years of struggle, finally got their the hill area of Modi'in declared as a national park. And that is really critical, not just for the beautiful open space, but really as part of the ecological corridor running north and south through Israel um, for the, so biodiversity can flourish and all that means to our lives. So I think that they're also, as Alone said, that small strategic grants can really make a difference. Did anybody else have a question that they wanted to ask? You can feel free just to open your microphone. But Marla, to the microgrant uh, issue, that's online and, and Sigal, I think back in the day, early days of the environmental work we were doing through Karev uh, Foundation, um, we were doing just that. We were um, giving very small grants. And a lot of times it was more on the legal side. It was, it was giving small pushes on, 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 of, of legal help to activate a lot of these small community groups, these grassroots groups that uh, end up, you know, making things a lot more effective because they couldn't afford and the legal kick was really what they needed. Right, and Stephen, actually, if you continue on that front, I understand that one of them, 
your strategies through David Suzuki Foundation is really on policy change. And I'm wondering if you can give a little perspective of why, if that's correct, if why you feel like that's one a really key angle to hit. Well, you know, obviously it's always based on policy and that's where things get frustrating because governments come and governments go. We happen to have a liberal government in power right now where I know that a lot of Israelis were very fond of the Harper government, but the Harper government for Canada, when it comes to environment, the doors were closed for 10 years. We had no one to talk to. There was no reception, zero. Now with the Trudeau government, we have a, a whole team to work with. And before the Harper government got in, uh, we were working with the Kretchen government and uh, Paul Martin, and we were, uh, we were large advisors to uh, Canada um, being a signatory to Kyoto. So, um, you know, you have those victories, and, but you have to have an open door. So now, uh, thank goodness, in the US, you have uh, the open door again. So I think it's, it, it, the, the policy work is, is, ever, is always going, always going, but sometimes that door is closed and things can get very frustrated and very bogged down. So that's why it's also very important to, to, to be local and to, to work on not just national policy change, but with your local governments, your local cities, your local towns, and trying to get change uh, every which way and engaging citizens. I mean, you can do it from the top and that's where you might affect eventually more change, but it's just really uh, bottom-up uh, work. And if I remember correctly, David Suzuki Foundation is also extremely science and evidence-based. Yeah, we're and... science-based. I mean, David's a scientist. David's daughter, who's coming in as the new executive director, is a PhD candidate. And, uh, you know, we based everything on science and, you know, data doesn't lie. Right. And I, I, I think at least my experience in the U.S. is that uh, policymakers are really looking for credible NGOs to even help with legislation. I don't know if that's the, your experience. Oh, 100%, 100%, if, if the door's open. And Alon, do you feel like that's the case in Israel in terms of Israeli policymakers open to getting uh, legislation wording from NGOs? I kind of agree with Stephen's assessment. It's a lot of luck, it's who you know and if you happen to have a minister of environment who's a little more cordial or a little more open-minded, you might be able to do amazing things. Um, we had a brief window of time now, 10 months, where the chair of our Interior and Environment Committee was the woman that you saw in the Meatless Monday, an environmental activist who actually got into parliament. And she was an, you know, had an open door to every environmental group. And that was a, it was a great thing. So uh, I think when you have these opportunities, you have to seize them because they don't always exist. And sometimes you do face a wall, even when Theoretically, there's a wonderful environmental platform behind the party. It really depends on the people in power. Okay, and we're going to persist. So I want to thank all of our speakers, Professor Alon Tal, uh, Stephen Bronfman, Valerie Bucard of the Nathan Cummings Foundation, and of course, my personal thanks to Sigal Yanni Feller, who is JFN Israel's Deputy Director, to Gil Yaakov, who's sitting next to me, uh, who's a consultant to the Green Funders Forum, and to Sherry Fox, who is my co-chair in the Green Thank Funders you. Forum. My and, luck. Yes, so happy to see you. Can I well, actually, you? well, okay. okay. Well, I just <laughs> want to just say, though, I want to reiterate that the Green, because it's hard to hear me as well, but the, really the Green Funders Forum is the address for funders looking to make a difference. And again, that's whether or not you're hitting the environment because it's one of your main funding priorities, like it is for me, or whether you want to intersect it with your existing funding priorities because they all do really interrelate. And I'm sure Valerie would be happy um, to be a resource for that as well. Or again, as I said, whether you want to set aside a portion of your grant making just as a kind of insurance policy, one, two, three percent, because again, it all affects us. And you know, we just had this disastrous oil spill in Israel, and suddenly we woke up and we understand that the, the sea is not only the recreation for us, it's really the air we breathe and it affects our the water that we drink through the desalination plants and our power plants are on the sea. It's really affects all of our lives. So it's it's uh, it can be really an insurance policy. And again, the Green Funders Program, we provide a lot of programming for awareness and education and networking, but we're also really here to build your skills. And we also offer free personal consultations. So come to us, to Sigal and Gail, who Gail is going to put our um, email addresses in the chat, because I think 
we really want to help you on your personal journey. And we, with these, through these personal comfort consultations, we can really raise the bar and move people to action and impact. And I think, at least I think I'm speaking for everybody here, we want to move beyond talk and really move to action. And now, Seagal, I will let you say something. No, you said everything. I just uh, <laughs> I, I have nothing left but to say thank you, Marla, and thank you, everyone, for staying with us. And really, as someone who's been following the environmental movement in Israel from the early 2000s, when the Bronfman Foundation, together with the Nathan Cummings Foundation and uh, the New Israel Fund, founded a funder collaborative that I had the, the privilege to run for its first 10 years, Philanthropy played a critical role in developing Israel's environmental movement, the awareness, activism. It really wouldn't have happened without philanthropy backing it up and really having a vision to where it could go. And I think we now in this second round really need philanthropy to be here to push it forward on a global level and, and help make a difference for our kids and our grandkids for, for us to have a future. So it's really, you know, with no cynicism involved and, and we just... Thank you all for coming and we should continue to try to figure out what we can do together and better to make a difference.